Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode 111 of How I Built It. Today, my guest is Laura Elizabeth of Design Academy. I love Laura's story so much. I met her at Cabo Press, and her uh, talk that she hosted was about kind of improving design and UX and things like that, but not in the normal ways you would think, like make things look prettier or whatever. She uh, talked about converting uh, or answering real questions and converting in a real way uh, that would aid UX and UI and really make your brand and your designs stand out. Now, today we're going to be talking about how she built uh, her design academy and how she wanted to teach design to developers. As a developer myself, I know that is a daunting task and she does it very well. From her journey of research to actually launching the course to a ready and raring to go audience, I think this is a fantastic episode for anybody who wants to build an online course. I certainly learned a lot and I started to put some of this stuff into practice and I hope you learn a lot too. So uh, we will get to all of that and more, but first a word from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Plesk. Do you spend too much time doing server admin work and not enough time building websites? Plesk helps you manage servers, websites, and customers in one dashboard, helping you do those tasks up to 10 times faster than manually coding everything. And let me tell you, I recently checked out their new and improved WordPress toolkit, and I was super impressed by how easy it was to spin up new WordPress sites, clone sites, and even manage multiple updates to themes and plugins. With the click of one button, I was able to update all of my WordPress sites. I was, again, incredibly impressed by how great their WordPress toolkit is. You can learn more and try Plesk for free at plesk.com slash build. That's plesk.com slash build. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of How I Built It, the podcast that asked, how did you build that? Today, my guest is Laura Elizabeth, founder and things doer of Client Portal and Design Academy. Laura, how are you today? I'm pretty well. How are you? I am fantastic. Uh, I appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, Laura and I met at Cabo Press. This is uh, one of the, I guess it's going to be an interview series because I have four or five people from Cabo Press that I'm interviewing. Uh, and Laura talked about kind of good design as part of, uh, well, maybe you can actually, maybe why don't we, instead of me trying to butcher what you <laughs> talked about, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yeah, so I, I have a couple of things. So the first thing I do is I teach design to developers. And the second thing I do is I have a WordPress plugin called Client Portal, um, which is a place for freelancers and agencies to store their deliverables. But, you know, like you said, we met at Cabo Press and at Cabo Press, I was talking about um, design. So I love talking about design, teaching design to people, whether it's developers or founders. Um, and I, we were just talking a lot about how um, design can help increase customer engagement and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it was, it was pretty fun. It was an amazing event. Yeah, it was great. And I really enjoyed uh, your talk and I um, just, I think there was a lot of good things to think about that. I think you probably touch on uh, as we start talking about both client portal and design Academy. And so I'd like to focus on uh, design Academy a bit because I love talking about online courses and design and very selfishly. Uh, I think I'll be able to get a lot of good information from you. But I uh, I I do want to start with uh, your WordPress plugin called Client Portal. Um, and I'm really interested of kind of from a design aspect because I am a developer and I generally take a very uh, maybe function over form approach. But I know that there's, uh, as you talked about, uh, at Cabo, um, a lot of things that go into creating good design and kind of guiding the user along the right path. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So with with Client Portal, it's it, it's a really simple tool and it's something that I made for myself to use with my clients. Um, I used project management software before and my problem 
with that was that it was all super complex, had a huge learning curve, and frankly, clients didn't use it, and it was expensive. And I realized that I actually just wanted something really simple, um, kind of no frills, but really nicely designed because design was important to me as a as a designer and I felt like everything I needed I gave to my clients had to be nicely designed throughout the process because I felt like they were expecting it um so I made client portal um just a very simple place to keep all your assets together so it's kind of it it's branded to your website um and the design was actually is really simple so it fits in with pretty much any website and it doesn't look like you're using a third-party tool but you can kind of keep all your third-party tools that you're using and link out to it from this um, central place so yeah the design was the design was super important just to me to use with my clients and then when I ended up selling it to other freelancers and agencies that was actually one of the main things that people comment on and the reason that they buy client portal versus something more complex because because they say you know client portal makes me look good because client portal looks good and when you're working with a client and their first impression of you and your project or maybe not quite your first impression but the first impression when the project's actually started when you've sold the the product um, is this being presented with this custom unique dashboard where everything lives it just gives them a really good feeling Um, and that sets the tone for the entire project that you're a professional that this is going to be great Um, and it kind of sounds a little bit trife in a way um, but I think the people do care about design and they do like when something is nicely designed and so yeah that was the, it's one of the interesting things being a designer turned I guess product creator mm-hmm. is that design is such a huge thing in everything I do and it's partly because I feel the pressure as a designer to make everything look good um, but there's been a ton of benefits um, along the way for doing for prioritizing that. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, talking about client portal specifically, I mean, getting stuff from your client can be, um, a, let's say, a job unto it, you know, unto itself. And if you use something complicated, uh, they're going to be less likely to want to kind of use that tool. So uh, simplicity in its design and making it very intuitive is, is incredibly important for the entire process. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, when you're using something more complex, especially with a client, you know, clients turn over relatively quickly a lot of times and they don't want to learn a new tool every time they work Mm -hmm. with someone because maybe they're working with a designer, maybe then they're working with someone else, a business consultant. And if they all have these separate tools, um, that's a lot to learn. They don't want to do it. And they just, for me, I found they just resorted to email and then I'd have to take their email and put it into a project management tool. Whereas with client portal, the client's not expected to do anything. The client does not have to do anything at all with it apart from save the link. Um, and they just log into it and they can find all their files, everything they need, um, right there. Um, and even after the project's completed, um, I always had this issue of clients would email me like six months after a project had finished being like, Hey, I lost that logo that you did for me. Can you send it again? And it was super frustrating because maybe I'd store them on like external hard drives and I wouldn't have it on my computer and I'd have to dig it out. And it was just really annoying that I felt like clients couldn't keep hold of the stuff that I sent them. Um, and it was just taking up a bunch of time. So, um, client portal also helps with that. And it's another reason, um, that I made it. Great. I just this morning had that very issue, like finding client related information and I had to like dig through email and that ate up a bunch of my time. Right. And yeah, this is, yeah, it's awful. Um, and the, the converse is you say, what project management tool do you like to use? And if they like to use one, then you have to learn that one. Right. So this is a nice, uh, a nice middle ground. It's easy to use for everybody. And, uh, yeah, I, I really like that. And so part of the reason I wanted to talk a little bit about this is because it gives us some groundwork to Design Academy, right? Where you mentioned that you teach design to developers. As a developer myself, I already know the answer to this, but why is it important for developers to know design? So, you know, developers, I so the reason I teach developers specifically is because I 
during my freelancing work, my favorite clients were always developers. If I could just work me as a designer and with a developer, the project was amazing because they got what I was doing. I got what they were doing. We both had mutual appreciation of each other's craft and we didn't have the client in the middle, you know, screwing things up. So <laughs> I loved working with developers. Um, but one of the, the problems that they had when I would speak to them is they had all these amazing ideas for different products and tools that they wanted to build. Um, because, I mean, you might be able to relate to this, but it seems like developers just always like making things. Just That's just what they love to do. Um, yeah. But the problem that they had was, you know, they wanted to make something they wanted it to look decent because everyone else was making things that looked good. They wanted to be able to do the same thing, but they couldn't necessarily hire a designer to work on it with them because maybe it was going to be something that was open source or maybe it was something that they didn't actually know whether people would pay money for yet and they just and they just wanted to validate it a little bit. Um, so I, the reason I actually teach developers is because I want to give them those tools to be able to make something look decent um, without needing to hire a designer. Um, that said... I, I don't think developers have to learn design. Um, I think there's a lot of pressure on developers to be good at everything. You know, all these mm -hmm. new frameworks and everything that come out, it's overwhelming. And I know that sometimes it can feel like it's just too much. So I don't think they have to. Um, but I think it's a, a really good idea um, if they can learn just a few principles to make something look decent, not anything award-winning, but just make something look decent. Because the thing about design is that those skills that you have, once you've learned those principles, you keep them forever. You know, it's not like a, it's not like a, a framework or a new tool where there's something else out in a month and you have to relearn it. It's just something that, something that they can learn now that's going to give them really lasting benefits. So I would say that it's really beneficial for developers to learn design, um, but I wouldn't say that they absolutely have to learn. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. I kind of feel the same way moving from developer to designer, you know, there's the question of do designers need to know HTML and CSS? And no, I don't, I don't think so. Uh, and in some ways I think maybe that could inhibit what the designer is thinking, right? If they know the limitations of HTML and CSS, maybe their designs won't, will, will maybe show those limitations. But, yeah. um, so, but I do like this, this thought, right? I want them to make something look decent. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's hard to, uh, hire a designer, right? But then on, on the other side, uh, when they get to a point where they are ready to hire a designer, maybe they hire you and now you're both speaking the same language, right? Uh, yeah. I'm not just saying make it pop or whatever, <laughs> you know, whatever designers hate to hear. I would hate to hear that one. So <laughs> yeah, it, it make, it does make it a lot easier when you come to hire a designer. And also it, it's has that kind of. I think most developers that I speak to, they they want to get into um, products in some way. So, you know, they want to be able to design to make something look decent. And then when they get enough uh, revenue behind them, they want to be able to hire a designer to maybe do some branding and figure out, you know, how this is all going to fit together. Um, but then on top of that, the knowledge that they've learned back in their early days on design, when they need to add a new feature or when they need to tweak something, which is going to happen all the time, unless you've got a full-time designer working for you or a team, um, you're going to need to know how to do that. So yeah, it's really good. It, the skills are really good when you're working with a designer because you have a bit more of an appreciation for what they're doing, but they're also going to help you after when you, um, you know, need to change things and you don't want to completely wreck the design. And, and I find it, you know, you were talking about how designers need to learn or designers don't necessarily need to learn um, HTML and CSS. Um, it's completely true, but if they if they know a little bit, it's definitely going to help them. But they don't they don't need to. So it's it's yeah it's it's one of those. It's a really it's a really difficult balance. So um, yeah, it's useful in pretty much all aspects. Yeah, absolutely. And and one more point on this before we kind of get into the research of Design Academy and how you kind of built the platform and how you marketed it uh, is when I was doing full time web design development, right? One of the things that I would do is convert PSDs to working websites. And I know that there were a few very design oriented uh, web developers I worked with who would kind of notice if like font typography was off just by a little bit. 
I absolutely did not notice that until I kind of got more mature in the design side of things. Like they're like, this is off. And I'm like, how, how do you, no one notices that, but they spent a lot of time on that design yeah. to make sure it looks good. That so. is so true. Yeah. The more, yeah. the more you learn about design and I find it, especially with things like typography, the more you know about it, the more you notice when things that you didn't, you never noticed before. Um, and it's one of those things that you could you could argue that well, unless it's going to be just designers looking at my product, who really cares? Um, but you know, even though a non-designer might not be able to notice specifically what's wrong with the design, um, they will know that something's off. They, you just kind of get this. You're going to have this feel like when you look at mm. a website and they're kind of similar in structure, but one just looks designed and one doesn't, and you don't know why but it, that's just how it is. Um, and so when you learn design, you kind of learn how to notice what the problem is. And you kind of say, you know, nine times out of 10, it's probably something like spacing, you know, things are too mm -hmm. squished together or alignment, right. you know, really, I mean, really simple things that you wouldn't think would make a difference, but it's all these really tiny things uh, that build up. But yeah, that's such a good point. Um, and I think it's completely true that you just don't notice until you start learning. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's like, I'm very reluctant to point things like that out to my wife who wouldn't generally notice that. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to ruin this for you, but <laughs> here you go. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know the feeling. This episode is brought to you by Pantheon. Starting a new project? Looking for a better hosting platform? Pantheon is an integrated set of tools to build, launch, and run websites. Get high-performance hosting for your WordPress sites, plus a comprehensive toolkit to supercharge your team and help you launch faster. On Pantheon, you get expert support from real developers, best-in-class security, and the most innovative technology to host and manage your websites. You can sign up a new site in minutes with a free account. You only pay when it goes live. That is my second favorite feature to Pantheon, only to the easy ability to create dev staging and live servers and push to GitHub. It's very easy to set those things up on Pantheon. So you can head over to pantheon.io today again to set up a free account. Pay only when it goes live. Thanks so much to Pantheon for their support of this episode and this season of How I Built It. So I really like this. Uh, talking about Design Academy, it's an online course and you're specifically targeting developers. We kind of talked about the inception for the course, but what kind of research did you do, if any, to really make sure your messaging is, is right to, to target developers? Yeah. So my research phase for this was actually like two years or more. Wow. Um, not on purpose. It was just, I was, I was freelancing at the time and I had very limited time to dedicate to this. Mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to make a course, um, but I, it, I really didn't, as, as much as people told me, I really didn't realize how much work it would be. And even when I came to do it, it was about triple what I thought. And I was, mm -hmm. I thought I was being pretty realistic with it. Um, sorry, I've kind of lost my train of thought there. So, um, oh, <laughs> no problem. What, when you just said it was like triple, it like made me think about somebody was like, oh, it should only take you like an hour to create this course. And I'm like, no, it will not. It will not take me an hour to create this course though. It, yeah, what, like that resonated like perfectly with me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It took so much longer than I thought. Um, but yeah, back to this. So I was thinking, what was the question again? It was about research. Um, so yeah, so when, so when I started researching it, what I did, the first thing I did is I knew I wanted to create a course. I didn't really have the time right now, but I thought, oh, well, I'm going to do it evenings and weekends. Um, that didn't happen. So what I did was I put up a landing page, um, which just had like an email opt-in. And the landing page was really bad. I can't remember what it said, um, but it was just basically saying, um, put in your email address and you'll hear about when I'm going to create this course on design for developers. It was really simple. Mm -hmm. um, so I did that and people were, you know, putting in their email address. I, I was doing things at the time, like I was speaking at conferences. Um, I was, you know, going on a few podcasts. I was doing a lot of guest posting because I wanted to get into writing. So I knew that building my audience, I, I knew I wanted to get from freelancing to products. And I knew that to get there, I needed an audience. So at this point, my focus was building that audience. Um, so what I did was I had the landing page 
anytime I did a guest post or something, I'd put a link to it in and people would just slowly sign up. Um, and I very, very slowly built a list of people. And what I do is I would, when they sign up, I just email them saying, Hey, what led you to sign up today? You know, what are you struggling with? Why do you want to learn design? And they'd reply back to me. And I would collate every single answer that they gave me and I'd put it into a spreadsheet, which I'm still keeping up to date today. It's absolutely humongous um, where I'd have headings like um, with their different struggles at the top. And then I'd actually paste in exactly what they were telling me um, underneath. And just over time, I was just I'd reply to them. My list was small, so I could actually have conversations with them, I'd find out what they needed, find out what they wanted it to be. And it just gave me a really good idea of um what Design Academy was going to be. So yeah, like I say, my research phase was like two years. It wasn't intentional. Um, I finally got to the stage where I, where I actually had someone email in being like, look, I really appreciate all the valuable content you're sending out, but can you just release like something, some paid course, please? Um, and <laughs> they sounded a little bit annoyed because they were like, yeah. I've been waiting for so long and every email you send, I'm hoping it's going to be something that I can buy and it's not. Wow. And uh, you know, I was like, oh, wow, I really need to do something now. So uh, that gave me the push to be like, okay, I'm going to open up pre-orders because I can't freelance while I'm building a course. I just can't. Mm -hmm. um, so I opened up pre-orders that did really well. And it allowed me to take off about three months, um, which I needed full time. I was doing about seven days a week building this course. Um, but the pre-orders really helped me do that. Um, so yeah, that, that's pretty much how I went from you know, research phase to actually doing it, but I definitely needed that kick and I needed to not be freelancing at the same time. Wow. So there's like a bunch of really good things to touch on here. Uh, first is you knew you needed to build an audience. I think that that's something that I've maybe learned the hard way over the last year because uh, I'm very like field of dreams when I'm like, I'll just build this and people will buy it. Uh <laughs> Your room. <laughs> Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So like, uh, that's not that's not usually the case, at least. And I like that you you set up a pretty simple landing page, you told people what they were getting, and then you've kind of built a rapport with them enough that one person was comfortable enough to be like, hey, I want to give you money. So can you please let me do that? Um, and then the other thing you did was open up pre orders. And this is advice that I hear a lot. You open up pre orders to uh, maybe maybe you didn't necessarily do this, but the advice that I get is is open up pre-orders to prove that people are definitely willing to pay for it. Because yeah. uh, if I mean, if you open up pre-orders and nobody buys it, then you don't have to spend seven days a week for over three months building a thing nobody's going to want. Yeah, exactly. And I I do agree with that. I think it's it's difficult though because the problem is is what happens if it's probably not going to be zero people buy it or a ton of people buy it what if like 10 people buy it and that right. 10 is just not worth it? Um, you then have to refund them, which is really awkward and probably looks really bad on you, um, which I wouldn't want to do. Um, so I think it is really good advice. The, the difference that I had though is that I was pretty sure that people would buy because I'd been so engaged in talking to my list um, and people were super passionate about it. And I could, I could, I... I don't really know how I, I could just tell that it was going to go well. Um, and I, and I think that's, I think that's kind of key because, um, you know, I've done things in the past where I, I've tried to productize different things and the response has been a bit kind of weak and mm -hmm. I could tell that it wasn't going to go well. And then when I did launch something, it didn't go well. Um, with design Academy, I didn't have that and I, I knew it was going to do well. So I don't know if I would have launched pre-orders for something unless I was pretty certain that I was going to do it. Um, but it's still a risk because you either have to refund everyone um, or you have to build it and maybe you haven't made enough money from it. So yeah, there's nothing that takes the risk away, I don't think. Yeah. And and you're absolutely right. I've I've been in both of those situations right now, right? And, and I'm actually currently in one where I have pre-orders and I'm certain, that, like I'm very sure the course will do well. I just haven't reached the right audience. So I'm in, like I'm kind of, accepting the risk of putting time into the course and then working with people to build up the right audience, which is, um, again, backwards from what you've done, but I really want to get this course out. I'm very excited yeah. about it. Um, and I don't think there's yeah. a, I don't think either of them are, 
uh, wrong ways to do it. Um, mm-hmm. There's stuff that I'm planning now, like I'm planning a, a different course that I'm not going to do pre-orders for. I'm just going to build it and then work on um, selling it later. Uh, so it just it depends so much on an individual situation. Mm-hmm. So you know, you you you're pretty sure, and you, um, you've got the experience to know that when you build the course, you're going to be able to find the right audience. It's just right now having something to sell is going to be better than trying to build that audience first. So yeah, it just depends completely. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Hover. Now, I've been using Hover for as long as I can remember, and I couldn't be happier with them. As a matter of fact, I've switched all of my domains from wherever I had them in the various places to Hover exclusively. And I know you probably have a ton of ideas for domain names. I do too. Uh, Whenever I have an idea for a domain, I go straight to Hover and purchase that domain. I even have them bookmarked on my phone. Uh, on its home screen so that I can quickly and easily get the domain I just got an idea for. They make the process as easy as possible with no upsells, just pure domain purchasing. My absolute favorite feature is the free Who Is Privacy. Not only do they protect your identity, but they do so without some added costs. That means when I buy a domain from Hover, I don't get spammed the next day by people trying to sell me services or mail from scams trying to get me to pay more for my domain than I need to. With Hover, who is privacy is free. Now, I could probably do an entire episode about Hover and all its great things, but for now, I will just tell you that if you want to learn more and get your domains from an honest, great domain registrar, you can head over to hover.com slash build something. You'll even get 10% off your first purchase just for being a listener. That's hover.com slash build something. And now back to the show. So one thing I love talking about because I'm an educator is uh, how you built the course. I, I'm looking at the, the page right now, which I will link in the show notes. It's designacademy.io. Uh, you've got six modules. Uh, and you kind of mentioned this, right? That you had a, a you have a big spreadsheet where you ask your subscribers what your what the biggest problem you have. Did that serve as as kind of a boilerplate for how this course was created? Yeah, so it it did, but it I I really struggled with figuring out how I was going to teach this. the The problem that I made that the mistake that I made was I made the course I. I, I figured the course was going to be too broad. You know, I, I'm going to teach developers how to design. I mean, that's super broad. Mm-hmm. There are so many different types of design that a developer is going to want to do. Um, some of them, so I found in my um, responses from the spreadsheet, some of them were working in-house at a company and they wanted to know how to um, build features that were on brand and looked really good. Um, other people were in e-commerce and they wanted to know how to make their e-commerce websites look better and convert better. Some people were doing a SaaS, some people were doing their own products and they wanted to know how to design and build a web app, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, there was just so many different avenues and I went, it took me so long to figure out how I'm going to teach this. And I realized that I was, it was, it's impossible to do all of that in one course. Um, so what I did was I, I completely stripped all that out and I thought, okay, what does every one of these different people need to know to give them the basics to be able to, you know, take what they're doing and take it further. Um, so, you know, the the initial course outline was just, um, it was based on the feedback, but it was, it was kind of based on these different personas. And I was trying not to go too far in one direction, but just to give everyone um, the principles. And, you know, what I'm actually doing with Design Academy now is I have that baseline course where you learn, you know, you learn about how to choose and pair colors. You learn how to um, look at a design and see what's wrong with it. Like we were talking about earlier, you learn about typography, all that stuff that everyone needs to know. Um, but what's going to happen now is that um, I'm currently building a bunch of different tracks for it. So we've got the web app track, then we'll have the e-commerce track and the the SaaS app track, uh, the training website track and all these different add-ons that you can then, it's, it's kind of like build your own design course based on yeah. what you want to learn. Um, and that really helped. And, and once I realized that, okay, I don't need to, ha- I don't need to teach everyone, everything in this Mm -hmm. course, it became a lot easier for me to put together a syllabus because I was just treading water, trying to figure out what to do for such a long time. And I I guess, you know, what I'm trying to say is for me, 
uh, niching the course, I suppose. I don't know if that's the right word, but really focusing the course um, helped me build it. Yeah, that's really fantastic because like, I mean, I've taught at the college level for 10 years, but students are kind of put in a box, right? They have a major, they have a minor, they have prerequisites for certain courses. And so coming up with the curriculum, you basically know the students who are going to be in the course. When you release an online course, it's anybody can register for it. And and it's up to you to make sure you're communicating the things you're going to learn. Here's what you know, or here's what I believe you already know. But the way you just described it, it sounds like you have the fundamentals course and then people can kind of choose their own adventure, right? Like those books from the 90s. So uh, that's, I love that. I think that's really cool. Uh, And and, um, I think that's probably a good takeaway, something for for at least me to think about as I move forward with my courses. Um, I I also noticed, so actually let's get to the tech stack a little bit. Uh, You have designacademy.io. Uh, I noticed that it's, uh, is it a closed enrollment, right? So it's. Yep. Yeah. Okay, cool. And how did you build this site? Uh, you know, uh, what are you using for the LMS and things like that? Um, so I use a, so I, but the site's built on WordPress and I use Sensei, uh, which is okay. the, the LMS. And then I actually custom designed the courseware and used a developer to help put that on top of Sensei. Um, again, because of that whole pressure, because I'm a designer teaching a design course, it, I felt like it all had to look really good. Um, so yeah, I custom, I custom designed all of the, the courseware and people really like that, which is great. Um, awesome. totally unnecessary for the vast majority of people. <laughs> if I didn't do that, I'd probably, I was looking into like teachable or Podia mm-hmm. or something, which is such a, it's such a faster, easier way to get something up. But I knew I wanted something custom because, you know, whenever I use services, I always regret it in the long term um, yeah. because I just want to own things and I want to be able to customize them. Uh, so yeah, so I, I built that myself. Um, and yeah, so Sensei Sensei has been great. Um, I haven't used anything other than that, so I can't actually tell you whether it's good or bad. It works. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, if it works for you, it's good, right? That's that's generally what I tell people. So yeah, it's good. Cool, very cool. And I love that you like kind of designed it and you went the customer route. I feel the. I feel the same way when I launched my online courses site. I was like, I'm going to spend no time doing development. I just want to focus on content. And then I was like, but I really want this thing. Like, I, I really want the video to be big at the top with the information below. And the like, I just, I knew how I liked to take online courses. I knew what worked for my students. And I have the ability to do that. So, I mean, I, I again, you're speaking my language here, uh, kind yeah. of de- designing the 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 whole experience. Yeah, it's definitely, I think it's definitely, if you've got that um, skill set, it's, it is worth it. It is, I mean, it has been for me anyway. I, I take a lot of pride in everything in the course and it's quite, a you know, it's basically based on me. I'm the one behind it. I'm the one mm-hmm. teaching it. So I wanted it to look good. Um, people would possibly argue that there were better things I could have been doing with my time, but I don't um, regret it because I love it when people email me saying, this course was amazing. Where can I buy it? And I'm like, oh, maybe I should sell the courseware <laughs> or the theme. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, man, that's really cool. Yeah. And uh, so it's a it's a video course, right? Are you using uh, something custom for the videos as well? Or are you using some solution for that? Um, I use Vimeo and then I just embed them into the courseware. Um, yeah, I was between Vimeo and what's the other one? Wistia. Wistia. Um, yeah. I loved Wistia because I love like everything they do as a company is just so cool. Um, mm. But it, it just came down to price in the end. Yeah, I've looked into Wistia as well. They do some cool things, but it's prohibitively expensive, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Vimeo ended up being pretty expensive for me in the end. Or it, it's not too bad. I can't actually remember what I pay now, but I, mm. I thought I could get away with one of the cheaper plans. And then mm-hmm. I realized that there were some features on the higher plans that, you know, customers really wanted. And I was like, ah, okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Very cool. Yeah. So I'll, I'll definitely link to both of those in the show notes as well. Cool. Uh, so I'm just going to do, man, we are, we've had a good conversation. We're coming up on time here. And so uh, the last thing I want to ask you, and maybe we can roll this into kind of plans for the future, uh, which we already touched on, was uh, you did a closed enrollment. What was kind of the reasoning behind that? 
So at the minute, I'm just testing things. So I don't know if I'm going to keep with a closed enrollment. Um, what I didn't want to do is previously I just did, you know, sales and discounts. Uh, I didn't really want to do that with this because I, it wasn't really working very well, I don't think. Um, to, aside from after the pre-orders, um, doing a discount wasn't didn't really seem to be working well enough. So I wanted to close enrollment and have, I think the reason the pre-orders went so well is because I was saying, look, this is going to be open for three days and then it's gone. Mm-hmm. for like a couple of months. Um, and I think that's what made it do really well. So I'm I'm kind of testing closed enrollment now to see if that has the same effect. I don't um, have the answer just yet, um, but I think I will keep it. Uh, as, the way it's kind of looking now, I think I am going to keep it as closed enrollment. One thing I've been toying with is uh, I've actually, I've been toying with an evergreen closed enrollment, which is where people sign up and do the free course and then they get pitched uh, and they have a very brief open enrollment period for a Mm -hmm. few days. Um, And I've been doing that for a while, but now I'm actually going to try closing enrollment for everyone and just doing the whole quarterly launch thing. So yeah, I'm, I'm just in the testing stage at the minute. Yeah. And that makes a lot of sense, right? I've, I've heard this from a lot of people who are doing online courses is you can't really create scarcity with a digital product, right? And scarcity is one of a big motivator, at least for people to want to buy. Uh, And you're right. Discounts, you know, I'm offering like a 33% discount on all of my courses right now because it's my birth month as we record this. And that's how old I turned. And uh, thank you very much. I made it 33 years. Um, But uh, uh, it's people aren't necessarily moved by the discount, right? Yeah. Uh, there, so there's something else you got you have to do, and I've heard a lot of great success with the closed enrollment. So yeah, um, I think I'm going to keep it up. The downside to what I've been doing is, like I said, I've been doing the evergreen one, um, which I don't I don't know if I really like. It's very easy for me, um, mm-hmm. but I think I want to switch to, like I say, the quarterly launches thing because I really like the idea of being able to do things like web live webinars um, and mm-hmm. stuff like that, and you know have a large group of people what was really cool about my pre-orders is I had a large group of people all join straight away and they join um, this Facebook group and they all kind of came in at the same time said hey they were all working through the stuff at the same time and I don't know if you saw um was it Jennifer's talk at Cabo Press on online courses um she was kind of saying that she does the whole everyone goes through at the same time and uh yeah I'm thinking of I'm thinking of moving to that because it seems you know it's got the it's got the scarcity, uh, but it doesn't feel as sleazy because, yeah. you know, there is a really good reason as to why enrollment is closed. It's not just because you're trying to make more sales. It's actually going to benefit the students too. Yeah. It's almost like a college semester, right? Where a class enrolls at the same time and then they have they have your undivided attention almost. Yeah, exactly. And you can answer questions and everyone's going, can help each other. And yeah, it's right. a lot. And, right. Instead of just kind of focusing on constantly selling, I think. Uh, these are words that you didn't say explicitly, but I like <laughs> you're selling me on this model right now as we talk. <laughs> cool. <laughs> well, I will uh, let you know how it goes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And uh, for those interested, I did interview Jennifer Bourne on the show, so I will link her episode in the show notes and, and you can kind of get the full effect of what she talked about. Um, so, man, this episode has been great. Uh, Laura, I do want to ask you my favorite question, which is, do you have any trade secrets for us? See, I don't know. I've been thinking about this for a long time and I, I don't know. I don't know if I really do. The only the only thing I could really think of is um, one thing that's really helped me is I try to build in the open a lot um, by it's really hard to do if you don't like self-promoting. Um, but post, you know, everything that you're doing, um, if you're trying to sell like an online course, I definitely don't do this enough, but post everything you do. Like if I'm, if I'm designing something, even if it's not to do with my design course, you know, post it on Twitter or Facebook. Cause I've had some fantastic partnerships come from something I posted on Twitter that I thought nobody would see. Um, and it's been one of those things that, you know, where you say, you know, a lot, a lot of things is, is based on luck, but then, you know, you can increase your look surface area. I'm not sure who said that by doing stuff like this. It feels pointless, but it kind of works sometimes. So I don't know if that's really a secret though, to be honest. Oh, I, <laughs> I like that a lot though. I mean, that's, that's part of the reason this podcast exists, right? Is because I was asking people 
these questions. And I was like, maybe other people will benefit. And so now we're having this conversation in the open. So I think that's a really good trade secret. And social media has enabled it, enabled us to do this, right? Maybe the next time you're editing or something, you can just like have your Instagram story going and just talk about what you're doing. I think that would be really cool. So awesome. Well, Laura, thanks so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Where can people find you? Yeah, so you can, you can, if you want to find out more about Design Academy, you can go to designacademy.io. Um, if you want to find out about Client Portal, you can go to client-portal.io. Uh, don't put hyphens in domain names, by the way. I regret that so much. <laughs> um, and then if you want to, if you want to say hi, you can, um, best place to get me is Twitter. It's at Laurium, so L A U R. IUM, um, or you can email me. My email address is on those two websites that I just showed you. So perfect. I will link uh, all that and everything that we talked about in the show notes. Uh, Laura, thanks so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks again so much to Laura for joining me today. Again, I, I learned so much uh, from this interview. I loved everything she said about uh, you know doing things like designing in the open and. Um, the need to build an audience if you want to go from freelancing to products. That's a lesson that I learned the hard way. I wish I had that advice two years ago. Um, And so I hope that as you think about building a course, uh, you take her advice to heart. Uh, My question of the week for you is, do you plan on building an online course? And if so, what's it about? Let me know via email, joe at howibuilt.it or on Twitter at jcasabona. For all of the show notes, you can head over to howibuilt.it slash 111. If you liked this episode, feel free to give it a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps people discover the show. And until next time, get out there and build something.